The third element of the outer triangle of our schema uh, concerns signs of wear, and these can come about from a number of factors. The most obvious, perhaps, uh, is wear itself, impact from the use of the artefact. The maintenance of the artefact often results in wear and tear. Um, handling will account for some wear and tear. Misuse is another example. Uh, and environmental considerations, uh, if the thing has been left out uh, in the rain, for instance. So we'll start with everyday use of an artefact, and we'll look at this um, uh, mason's mallet, which quite clearly has been indented badly as a result of repeated use with hard steel chisels. Uh, the wood is beech, it's quite resilient, but it will ultimately wear down in time. Uh, what's particularly interesting about this wear on this artefact is that it gives you an indication of which side was preferred by the mason, because this side is much more indented than that side, and there are other, other parts of the, of, the, um, of the mallet which are hardly touched which will su could suggest that, in fact, this was a deliberate attempt at wear by the user of the mallet uh, to attain a better impact onto the chisels. The next type of wear uh, is shown quite nicely on this knife, which is a domestic piece of cutlery, which originally would have had a blade that went parallel to the back and then came down. But it's shape has been changed, probably originally because of sharpening, excessive sharpening, and then later on probably deliberately to, to create more of a sort of boning out knife. But if you look very closely at the way in which the sharp side of the knife works, you can see that it's been deliberately uh, honed down rather than machined in a factory. The, uh, this fork uh, shows how the electroplating on it has been worn away as a result of excessive use. Uh, and uh, if you look very closely, you can see a line where the, the electroplating still survives. But then the base um, nickel silver is starting to show through on a large portion of uh, both the back and down at the business end, if you like. This fork has a very unusual design. And in fact, it's a, a, a very specific uh, fork designed for uh, eating oysters. Um, now, the only way that can be revealed, unless you knew that form, uh, was, is through identification of the maker's mark, uh, which is a firm called Elkinton's, which is actually quite famous for developing electroplating. Uh, but once you know that the maker is Elkinton's, you can look at some of their catalogues, and they uh, registered this design as an oyster fork uh, in the 1840s and 1847. Once you know it's an oyster fork, then other signs of use start to make sense. For instance, the extreme wear that's on one side of the tangs of this fork, and likewise, the, the twisted and bent nature of what is actually a quite a hard piece of uh, electroplated nickel silver. But with the idea of this being the sole tool with which to eat oysters, uh, you can see that, in fact, what you would do is hold your oyster on your plate. You would then put the tangs into the, to open up the, uh, the shell. And by twisting, you would get th those signs of use quite clearly developing. Uh, and likewise, uh, the fact that you're possibly, if you're right-handed, you're going to be constantly using these two tangs more than the other two. So there's a bit of a symbiotic relationship between the basic information you can get, and once you reach an identification, you can go back to the artefact 
and maybe either in reinterpret or find a better understanding of other forms, uh, other aspects of it in terms of use or in terms of even uh, marks and identifying features. Uh, this plough spanner uh, was found in a ditch and had been buried in earth for a very long time. Uh, and the result uh, is that the surface is heavily pitted because of rust. Uh, after being found, it was uh, quite vigorously cleaned up. Uh, and so as a result, the pitting uh, is much clearer now because all the excess rust has been removed uh, and then the, uh, the surface has been waxed to stop any further corrosion. Uh, there's a final element to this, uh, which is, of course, reuse of artefacts. Um, and this homemade screwdriver uh, is a good example of that. What we have here is a piece of uh, boxwood, uh, which either has been smoothed from a piece cut from the hedgerow, or has been whittled down from a, a larger artefact. Uh, and into it has been driven a cut down, probably file or some sort of thick piece of high quality steel, which has then been sharpened up to turn into the business end uh, of uh, a mini screwdriver. I don't think we talk enough about secondary and tertiary uses of artefacts. Uh, the one that always occurs to me is the way in which a uh, a tin to hold, say, uh, OXO cubes uh, is used time and again to, with refills of OXO cubes and eventually then uh, becomes a holder for nails and screws until it loses its lid and then maybe it becomes a container for sump oil in your car. Uh, and so you have an artefact there which goes through th two, three, possibly even four uh, phases of use. Uh, and at the point at which it enters the museum as an inquiry, obviously uh, can cause confusion in terms of its interpretation because of those second and tertiary uses. This element of signs of use brings us back to the core of the inner triangle in our schema. Uh, the interrelationship between form, function and materials uh, is very intimately connected with the way in which these items have been used or abused. Design style uh, and marks and inscriptions are much more to do with the dating of things as opposed to the, the actual core functions of them.